I've saved sort of uh, the best for last, if you will, although it's hard to compete with Dr. Pine, Steve. Um, but Peyton Schlosser is here. Uh, I mentioned her earlier in my introductory welcome talk. Peyton is a, a senior undergraduate student in geology, and I'm not going to sort of speak too too much about her because I, I don't want to steal too much of her thunder, but Peyton has been uh, really my right-hand woman on this project. Um, this is a very multifaceted project. We have, as many of you in person have seen, we have a very robust physical exhibit, and before you leave the building today, please do avail yourselves of the exhibit. Indulge, if you will. Indulge in the exhibit. It's fantastic. Kudos again to my colleague at ASU Library, Amy Watson, for designing it, and for all of the other various tech support and other folks at ASU Library who supported the materialization of that fantastic exhibit, sort of micro exhibit, if you will, downstairs. Please check it out if you, can, if you haven't already. But there's also a, a significant digital component. Of course, this entire symposium event has been uh, live streamed, and it is, needless to say, recorded for posterity. So our fantastic folks from the ASU Marketing Hub and the videography team, they're going to be chopping up this video, these video presentations, and we will have them available online for posterity. Um, so even if you didn't uh, tune in live or weren't here in person, uh, this is all recorded. Um, because it is indeed, I don't think any of us mentioned, and it should have really fallen on my shoulders. I don't think any of us mentioned the coincidence, the, the coincidence that it's actually the 140th anniversary of the publication of the 1882 tertiary history of the Grand Canyon. So it is sort of a momentous and coincidental uh, fact that uh, we're celebrating it now. Uh, I said I, wasn't, I wouldn't uh, bite uh, Peyton's time here, but Peyton is going to be demoing I hope, because we have a major tech issues. You want to start pulling that up if you can? And maybe with the help of our tech lead, Matt Trobaugh, again, kudos, kudos to Matt Trobaugh. But um, Peyton is going to show you really one of the most sort of robust and most substantive contributions of this project, Dutton's Atlas, How Cartography Helped the Canyon Become Grand. First and foremost, we're a library, right? Uh, I run this mapping center here. I talked about it earlier, the Mapping Geospatial Hub. But what do libraries do? They make information resources available, right? Uh, there's some key buzzwords in, in library science, if you will. Discoverability, a fancy jargony word that means how do you find stuff? How easy is it to find something or discover it? Um, discover specifically information resources. So discoverability and, of course, accessibility. Once you find it, how do you get it? How do you take these resources, integrate them into your own research undertakings, your own projects? Because that is fundamentally what a library is for. I'm talking a lot, partly to stall, by the way, uh, to get you set up. So take it away, Peyton. Um, and please feel free to reintroduce yourself. Talk a little bit about the project. And you know what? I was going to talk about the 3D exhibit that Eric Friesenhahn, my man in the back, likes to say low-key, who modeled out. But Peyton, go ahead and take it away. Show the Atlas uh, sheets, and please show the 3D exhibit if you're at liberty to, please. Too. So with the way that today's events have gone, I appreciate your guys' patience. This is actually my first symposium, my first public talk ever, even though I'm a senior undergraduate, and so I have to give my mom an honorary shout out. Hi, mom and dad, who are watching from Missouri. I'm out of state, so thank you for bearing with me. She would have been really upset if I did not do that. So yeah, as Matt said, I've been the student worker on this project since March of this year, and even though it's only been like seven months, I feel like this has been a lifetime. I have become so familiarized with the Grand Canyon and each and every little crevice, historical, sociocultural, and uh, art. And most importantly, geology. I care about the geology. Not that everything else isn't great, but the rocks are where it's at. And so as a uh, student of Dr. Simpkins, it was really exciting and invigorating to see what uh, his project was all about today or his presentation. And so without further ado, I am going to get into my talk, which is about the web applications that we've produced for the Digital Atlas. So the Digital Atlas can be accessed in two ways, either through the global navigation bar or this cute card right here that I made. So we're going to click it without further ado. And here is our Atlas page. So as Julie Tanaka said earlier, we have a total of 23 sheets in the atlas, and although there are 23, only 12 of those are actually geologic maps. And although there are 12 geologic maps, many of those can actually be grouped together or stitched, just as Mark Kled did with his photography, to make a single map. And so here we have six total sheets, well actually five. One of them comes from the monograph, plate four, she's special. And then if we scroll down, we also have a landmark locations map of all the art featured in the monograph and atlas. But I'm going to come back to this. And I'm going to pick my favorite, sheets 20 through 23. And it takes a second to load. I don't, I don't have favorites, but this one is probably the most expansive and also the beautiful and intricate. And so I'm going to zoom out here. 
And here we are, these are sheets 20 through 23 stitched together. And although when zoomed out, the resolution is a little bad, but if you think about draping a map over the states of Nevada, Colorado, or, I'm sorry, uh, Nevada, Utah, and Arizona, that's gonna be a pretty pixelated map. That's a really big piece of uh, geographical information. And so we have four widgets here on the side. We have our layers, our about tab, a base map gallery, and a swiping widget. We're gonna begin with the layers list. And so here, as I said before, this is the sheet. It has been cropped in georeference and then draped over the landscape, the topography. And then I painstakingly trace these geologic layers and vectorize them. And so when you click on a geologic layer as it pops up, it takes a little time to load. Uh, there is geologic information associated with that unit and it comes from Steve Simpkins' uh, Trail of Time. And so it's really succinct. It's like his presentation in little bite-sized pieces. And it applies for all layers within this. And if we zoom out, you'll see if I select a single unit, like our basalt, or I'm sorry, tertiary, I'm at an oblique angle, so it's a little difficult. You'll see that all units uh, that fall within this illuminate. They all are selected. So besides our historical geology, we also have a contemporary layer. And this is where the slide tool comes in handy. This is a lot, like we said, it's not as digestible. But this is a, it's a really brief introduction to what the unit is, and it provides an opportunity to compare and contrast and see how geology and our knowledge of the region has evolved over time. So I'm going to deactivate that. Very simple. And I am going to activate the geology layer because that's my favorite. That's my baby. I'll come back to this in a second as we navigate to the About tab. This is a sheet record, so it's all the uh, informational or contextual information. Of course, without, uh, you know, what would this be without the pros of Clarence Dutton? Each sheet has its own little note. And here we can see that, uh, regrettably, they were unable to traverse into this southwestern, hold on, where'd it go? There she is, uh, southwestern portion. So although when we turn our base map back on, click, we will see that this is topographically mapped. They did not get out here and map the geology. And that's what's something really cool about our 2005 contemporary layer is that we can see what is missing. So like I said, I'm gonna unclick some of these bad boys right here, click, click. Another fun tool is our base map gallery. Uh, just like how it sounds, it allows you to go through and change your base map. And so right now we have an imagery hybrid so you can see the Grand Canyon and the district in all its glory. But let's say I wanna see a USGS national map. And instead, it changes it, and so you can see our new, well, not our new, but our historic geologic layers draped over contemporary topography. And I'm gonna change it back to imagery because I missed the Grand Canyon already, even though I did not get enough of it today. And another tool that we have, as I said, is the swipe widget. And now that I'm on the side, it's a little hard to see it. Come on, mama, there she goes. And with this tool, you can swipe to reveal the underlying uh, imagery which I think is really fun. So I'm gonna put that back on and we can compare and contrast the topography from 1882 with the information that we have today through aerial photography. Let's see. Uh, I don't think I'm missing anything there. We can easily return back to the home page from clicking Dutton's Atlas. And then part two, which is a little bit more monograph-esque. So what we did here, and it was actually a little bit tricky, we took each image from the monograph, and we found it on Google Earth. And that is painstakingly long to try and match, as Mark Klett said, these fictional landscapes. You have to find each and every aspect and try and narrow down the best that you can, and obviously that is time consuming. But I did it, so you don't have to. Now let's navigate, enhance, and say, oh boy, what's this point? And you click on it, and it's a recent lava flow on the Uinkaret. And here is an excerpt written by Dutton, and then the image associated with that plate. And we did this for all 34 locations. So it's incorporating historical context with what we have in our modern day. And this one is really simple. There's not as much going on. It's the same widgets except without the swipe. And here we have a list of every single location found and plotted. Now I'm gonna go back to our homepage to briefly introduce the 3D exhibit. I just want to say, Peyton, really quick. Yeah. Uh, before you sort of, uh, okay. sort of, no, 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 stay, stay right there. But before you brush over, what Peyton did, like you know, 
you can all see why Peyton's phenomenal, clearly, in the way she just presented that so eloquently and succinctly. But Peyton doesn't uh, exaggerate when she states how tedious and painstaking and uh, repetitive and iterative it does. It is a Herculean undertaking that Peyton has achieved right here. And like I was saying, in terms of accessibility and discoverability, Peyton's already done it for you. You know, some of these places, these landscape views are spectacular, right? But they're, you know, for most, most people will rarely, will, will probably never visit, most people here, dare I say, won't physically stand in those locales. They're extremely remote, hard to get to, unless you, you plan a long weekend trip with a good uh, four-wheel drive vehicle, you probably won't make it to most of these locales. So by geolocating them, you can literally see where, the, where Dutton and company stood when they drafted these pictures. So just, I just wanna sort of, before you brush over your accomplishment, give you major kudos. It's huge what Payne has accomplished there. Moving on. Thank you. Thank yeah, you, Matt. Kudos. No, yes, it's worth it. It's worth <laughs> it. Oh my gosh, you guys are too sweet. You're too sweet. I'm very humble when it comes to this stuff because I'm getting paid. I'm not going to sit here and labor over how hard it was, but Matt does like to give credit where credit is due, and I greatly appreciate that, which is why, even though this is a weird introduction, I am so honored to be a part of this team with such scholars and such kind people, and I'm going to brush over that sweet statement, and I'm going to go and show you the 3D exhibit, which is downstairs, and I'm sure you guys passed it and loved it. And so, to begin, this is very similar to uh, our 3D exhibit of our Map of Geospatial Hub, if you're familiar with that, you can click these uh, objects within a 3D scene. And like I said earlier, these little docs or these pop-ups, they have context uh, contextual information. And so here, I'd like to put Matt into the limelight because he's so humble. Matt took the time to create this cold copper cast of the Grand Canyon, and I f photographed it, and he wrote his own little verb, or I'm sorry, his uh, you know, section about it. And so this is, like Matt said, it increases accessibility. If you're an international student or if you're somebody who has not had the opportunity to come in like you lucky folks did today and check it out, they can do it from the comfort of their home and their jammy jams. And so, <laughs> a, like, uh, like Matt said, major kudos to Eric because he created these 3D models of rocks and that is incredibly hard and very difficult. So I'm going to awkwardly interrupt oh, you too. Really, I, I really, because yeah. Eric's down here. Eric despises the limelight. He's <laughs> he there does. just watching everything. Can I get a round of applause for Eric Friesen on here? Woo! Who modeled all this. Another very Herculean undertaking. All, all of us can sort of enjoy it as end users. And actually, oh my gosh. So Eric modeled this out. And my colleague who, sorry, Peyton, no, to, to see your thunder here. My colleague who recently left us for, for bigger and better things happens to be here right now. Uh, Jill Sherwood actually did the, the customized web application for this. So the, the, the sort of shell, if you will, the, the styling and other customized widgets that we're still actually tweaking out. Um, that's all due to Jill Sherwood here. So we, there's, there's been a team of sort of silent uh, operators, silent assassins, uh, if you'll permit the silly, <laughs> silly statement. But uh, these sophisticated end user applications require our dozens, if not hundreds of hours of cumulative work. And I just want to acknowledge my team, of course, Paint Schlosser, Eric Friesenhahn, and Jill Sherwood, who regrettably is no longer part of my team, but forever in spirit part of my team. Anyway, Payne, please continue, sorry. Uh, no, uh, truthfully, I feel like you wanted me to be brief, and I was brief, I'm not sure where else. Run Actually, Keep running it, all right. Okay, I'm gonna milk this, so. Well, what do you like about the exhibit? What, what's cool about, it? I mean, uh, oh, talk about the rocks, actually. I, and Steve Semkin right, brought these rock samples, and Steve, uh, not without the mic. A anything you want to add about the rocks? Uh, I know. Hold on. Let me let me give you the mic so our our online folks. I sure do. So there are three rock three rock samples you see there from left to right, and you notice the way they're on increasingly elevated pedestals. So that's that same principle. The stuff on top is younger than the stuff on the bottom. So the one on the left is the is the Vishnu schist, which is part of the basement rock at the very bottom of the Grand Canyon. The one in the middle is the red wall limestone, which forms a very prominent cliff about halfway up the canyon. And the, uh, the one on the far right is the Kaibab Formation, which makes up the rim of Grand Canyon. When you're walking the north and south rims, you're walking on Kaibab. So you know, we, could not, we could not put all the rock types in there. It would have been there. You know, if you want to see all of them, I encourage you to go visit the Trail of Time on the, uh, on the south rim. And we have all of them there. But, uh, but this is kind of a shout out to the Trail of Time, the bottom, middle, and top of the Grand Canyon. Awesome, thank you for that extra context, Steve Semkin. Um, so yeah, what else? Anything else we wanna show these people? Anyway, all of you here, check it out in person. If you haven't, we're sort of uh, winding down, starting our grand descent here. Um, if you haven't had the opportunity to check it out, needless to say, check out the exhibit. Or if you have to rush and enjoy uh, what, what remains of your Saturday afternoon, I sincerely am grateful that you spent any portion of your Saturday afternoon with us. But if you, if you, uh, if you have to rush out of here, 
It's okay. You can uh, the exhibit will be up until at least until the beginning of December. But you can always like uh, Peyton just said in your jammy jams <laughs> from jammy home. Jammy jams. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I thought it was going to be till January. I just heard the bad news. It's going to be until the end of the semester. So just for to be uh, you know cautious, we'll do it until December second. But like I said, uh, although it, it's it's a travesty in my eyes that we're going to sort of prematurely tear down that awesome exhibit downstairs. It will live in perpetuity right here online. And of course, there's, you know, I always prefer the real reality versus virtual reality, but, you know, uh, better than nothing, right? So uh, check that out. And needless to say, before you leave today, please check out, of course, the 1882 edition of the Church History of the Grand Canyon. We also have uh, 1977 uh, re reproductions. If you still have time, you please check out our unit, the Map and Geospatial Hub. Uh, there are so many thank yous, thank yous I want to give, but I'm going to actually abstain from doing that at the risk of excluding someone uh, rudely. But so many people brought this together. I want to thank all of you again for making this happen. Go enjoy the rest of your Saturday, folks. Have a great day. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much.